Hello, and welcome to today's special career track presentation, Effective Inventory Management. After participating in today's information pack session, you'll have a much better idea how, of how to always have the right item, in the right quantity, in the right place, and at the right time. We've included a link to a downloadable workbook in your email confirmation. Please use your workbook to guide your note-taking during today's presentation. By the way, this program is being recorded and, for the best viewing experience, you may want to click the scale button on your console toolbar. My name is Max Mueller and I'll be your host today. I've been dealing with inventory control since 1976 when I served as the Director of Operations and Transportation for a large food service company in the Midwest. Over the years, having balance sheet responsibility for organizations in both the distribution and manufacturing worlds, as well as being a consultant since 1990, I've had the opportunity to become acquainted with inventory control techniques that actually serve to help companies achieve inventory accuracy rates in the high 90s percentiles. In addition, some of you might be aware that I'm the author of a very popular book on inventory control and cycle counting titled The Essentials of Inventory Management that's published by Amicom Books Division of the American Management Association. Okay, enough about me. Let's go ahead and get started. For ease of comprehension, we've broken down this topic into five modules, namely Module 1, titled Inventory Accuracy. During this module, we'll discuss the basic nature of inventory as both a tangible, physical thing and as an intangible concept. Module 2 is titled Metrics, and what we'll discuss during that module is the necessity of determining inventory accuracy by counting things, not dollars. Module 3 is titled Slow Moving and Dead Stock, and obviously, what we'll be discuss there is the stuff that just sits in our stock rooms day after day, week after week, and for some of us, year after year. Module 4 is titled Forecasting Basics and deals with the underpinnings of the complex algorithms used in virtually all software systems. The last module, Module 5, titled Perpetual Inventories, deals with various approaches to creating an ongoing, deadly accurate inventory through cycle counting. All right, okay. Conceptually, inventory accuracy is all about achieving inventory optimization. Now, inventory optimization is a fancy way of saying that inventory accuracy is achieved when you do, you know, in fact, have the right item in the right quantity, in the right place, and at the right time. Now, how will you know that you've achieved optimization? Well, you know, it's when an item's shelf count matches its record count. And let me define those words. An item's record count is the amount reflected in the database, while an item's shelf count is the amount physically in the facility. Here's what I mean. Every item you stock exists in two separate worlds. First of all, inventory exists as a tangible physical item actually kept within the facility. That's an item's real life or shelf count. In other words, it's a real thing. However, all of your items also exist in an intangible form existing within the company records. That's its paper life or record count. Often, an item's paper life is more important than its real life. Why? Well, think about it. If I called you up and asked you if you had 27 widgets in stock, would you go out to the stock room to see if you had them? Of course not. You'd look at the records in either your computer or on a hard paper copy report. Since you frequently make purchasing, sales, customer service, production planning, and other decisions based on whether or not an item is shown as being in-house, you know, as per your records, an item's paper life can be just as important as its real life. The main problem in achieving accuracy is that these two lives move through your facility and system at different speeds. In other words, if you're doing real-time receiving where you barcode, uh, you know, scan in items as they're received and your scanner sends the information directly into the database through radio frequency, you know, through RF, then the items appear to be in-house in the database. However, what if you're short-staffed in the receiving department and it often takes more than a day to get things put away? You all know where I'm going with this. The longer it takes to go from dock to stock, 
the more inaccurate your inventory is because people can't find your items that your records say you actually have. Then what happens? Well, someone makes a stock adjustment relieving the missing physical items from the stock records. Then, when the items are actually put away, they don't exist because now their paper life no longer exists. And then, of course, we tell a customer we can't fulfill their order even though the items are actually here. Needless to say, uh, you know, I could have used an example where an item physically leaves the building and yet it still appears to be uh, in the house because it hasn't been relieved from the inventory reports. Now that actually often happens in batch software systems where the organization doesn't update its records often enough. In fact, let me go ahead and give you an example of that. I was doing a consulting job some years ago for a custodial supply company and their, their records were constantly wrong and their salespeople would make promises to customers, they'd go unfulfilled and it was a nightmare. So just by happenstance at 5 o'clock I'm standing behind the billing clerk and I think many of you know that in batch software systems often the system is updated at the time of billing. Well she gets up, she's going to leave. Well, there were a lot of uh, papers still in her inbox, and I said, Mary, where are you going? She says, it's 5 o'clock. I'm out of here. I said, but Mary, you know, you, you haven't finished all the billing. And so she gave me this so what look. And I said, Mary, if you go home right now, you'll mess up the warehouse. So she says to me in an angry voice, I don't work in the warehouse. I work for accounting. Oh, I see. Everyone else works for the ABC company. She works for a company called accounting. Now, if you all don't understand why I was upset. You think about it. The next morning, everyone in that organization, the purchasing agents, customer service, sales, it, it was not a manufacturing company, but had it been a manufacturing company, production planning, and on and on and on, everyone that dealt with inventory would believe that the records they were looking at the next morning are as up to date as the night before. The reality is that their records were no more up to date than the last time she made it to the bottom of the inbox. And we've all heard of the 80-20 rule, Pareto's Law. Do any of you doubt that in, uh, let's say, 30 minutes worth of paperwork in an inbox, that some of our most critical items, you know, the 15 or 20 percent, that represent 80 percent of our dollar value, of our sales volume, and so forth, that they're hidden in there? And everyone, that's the sort of thing that happens where you basically have, again, an item's shelf count and an item's record count, it's real life, it's paper life, floating through the system at two different speeds. Now, as can be seen from my examples, an item's real life and paper life can leapfrog around one another. Therefore, it's important to understand that these lives can exist independently of one another and to comprehend your own system, you must trace how both product and information move through your system. Now, an easy way to do this is to number one, draw a line vertically down a sheet of paper. Number two, down the left column, note each physical movement an item takes as it moves through your facility. Number three, down the right hand column, for each physical movement of the item, write down the answers to these questions. Who is supposed to write something down? Or you understand what I'm saying, or key something into the database, and when I say write something down, I either truly mean write it down manually or key it into the database. What are they supposed to write down? Who are they supposed to provide the information to? What's that person supposed to do with it? And what's the timing of each step in the physical movement and in the information flow process? I strongly urge you to do that. Many of the system disconnects that are pres uh, presently causing your inventory numbers to be off will reveal themselves to you if you'll follow my suggestion. To summarize, the longer the time lag between the inventory movement and information capture and updating of the record count, the greater the chance for error, lost product, and increased costs. Okay, now, before you do anything, however, you should start your corrective e efforts by establishing a baseline of where your inventory record accuracy is right now, this minute, today. Inventory record accuracy, IRA, is the percentage of agreement between the record count and the shelf count. A quick, accurate method of establishing your current IRA is to perform a test count, and let me tell you how to do that. 
select 100 items which represent a cross-section of all items. In other words, select all sorts of things. Fast-moving items, slow-moving items, expensive items, inexpensive items, those with both a long and a short lead time, and so forth. Count all 100 items in all the locations where they're located, and you measure accuracy by considering actual units on the floor, not their dollar value. Now, you've done this counting. Divide the number of accurate counts, that would be the numerator in this division problem, by the total number of counts, that would be the denominator. Accurate counts means where the record count and the shelf count exactly match. The answer to the division problem, the quotient of the division, is your record, uh, uh, your inventory record accuracy. In, in fact, let, let me give you an example. Let us say that you know we've selected these hundred items, we go out on the floor, we count them, and in 85 of those items, they are exactly right. They, the paper record and the uh, the physical record, what's out there, it all matches. So that's an 85% accuracy rate. Or if 92 of them match, uh, and once again 92, the numerator by 100, the denominator, the quotient of the division is 92, and that is our accuracy. Now, everyone, I want to say it again without being melodramatic. Establish a baseline. Find out where you are right now before you do anything to change your system. Now, in addition to what I've said, it's very important that you don't confuse your fill rate with your inventory record accuracy. Your IRA is a reflection of how well your shelf count and record count match. In other words, do your stock records accurately reflect what is actually in the stock room? Now, fill rate, though, all right, and it's also your fill rate is also your stock availability. That's a reflection of how effective your inventory is. In other words, did you have what you needed when you needed it? The fill rate looks at the qualitative nature of your inventory efforts. You know, a, a, a simple example would be, uh, and the formula is you take the items shipped divided by the items ordered. So if we were trying to do this for a given day, you know, for a single day, what we would do is, let's say we shipped out 1,247 items and 1,500 items were ordered. So we do the math and it ends up that we have an 83% fill rate. Now, what we just did is we looked at it on a one-time, one-day basis. But, you know, you could do this for the entire, you know, year so that you know, you could look at it, or like a grouping of items, it doesn't even need to be for a year, it could be for a grouping of item. So let's say we are interested in figuring out our stock outs, if you will, on an annual basis. So you would divide the number of days where all orders were uh, uh, not shipped complete, divided by the total number of the days where the orders were shipped complete. So in, in an example, let's say that we had 34 days where orders were not shipped complete, divided by 200 shipping days and so there are our, our you know fill rate our availability is 17 percent now this indicates that you were in fact unable to send out all orders uh, you know 17 percent of the time or if you want to state it more positively you were able to send out orders uh, you know complete 83 percent of the time so let me summarize your IRA might be hundred percent in other words, your inventory accuracy rate is 100%. However, that does not mean that you had available to you what you needed to fulfill all your needs at the time that you needed it. And everyone, don't get confused on that. Because again, the fill rate is more often than not a reflection of purchasing policies and practices. It has really nothing to do with warehousing, whether you're a good stock keeper or not. Okay. Now, the so what of all this is that computing your IRA gives you a baseline to measure your future efforts by. In computing your IRA, it's important to understand what you're actually measuring. So everyone, let's discuss metrics. First and foremost, measure things, not dollars. Let me explain some of the basic problems of using money to measure inventory you know, accuracy. Okay, Dollars don't measure what's actually available. 
it doesn't matter, you know, actually measure what's on your shelves. And, and I want to give you an example of that. You know, I'd mentioned that I was the operations director of a big food service company. And the uh, prison in Fort Leavenworth, Kansas was one of our larger customers. And one year we did an annual physical inventory and we had millions of dollars in stock. And we were only off by a very few thousand dollars. So everyone was pretty happy. However, I discovered during that annual physical that we had sent the prison 1,000 cases of peaches instead of 1,000 cases of pears. Now, you all understand, the, the price point of the peaches and the pears were, were, were basically the same. And so if you looked at it only in terms of dollars, everything looked fine, you know, as to what was in the house. But the reality is we had a terrible bust in our numbers. Now, in addition to that, you can simply change, you know, your inventory by changing your tax valuation approach. You know, honestly, by simply changing the tax treatment of your inventory, you're going to change the dollar amounts of what you have, even if you don't actually add or remove any physical items. You know, tax treatment often is an organization's chief concern regarding inventory valuation, and there are five common uh, inventory valuation methods. One of the older ones that, that uh, basically companies had to go with uh, up until I think it was about 1986 uh, when the law changed, uh, what everyone had to go with back in the day was first in, first out, FIFO. And that valuation method assumes that the first goods purchased are the first to be used or sold regardless of the actual timing of their use or sale. And, you know, that method is, is uh, most closely tied to the actual physical flow of goods. Now, I'll tell you what the problem is. The problem is, or was for that method, is if I buy widgets at 20 cents each this week and then buy them for 25 cents each a month from now, so long as I still have some of the 20 uh, cent ones uh, laying around, I have to value all of them at 20 cents. So ultimately, even though I've sold uh, items that cost me 25 cents, I'm going to pay taxes as though I made a profit on a 20 cent item. And so you end up paying, in that instance, you end up paying taxes on money you actually didn't make. Now, when the law changed, they authorized last in, first out, LIFO. And this works the other way. Uh, going back to the 20 cents and the 25 cent example, you know, I bought some at 20 cents, later on I buy some at 25 cents, and so I'm now allowed to basically take the 25 cents and, and, and put that retroactively on everything. So really the benefit there is you actually make a little bit more profit than you're actually paying taxes on. Now, um, notice if you will that in both examples we're talking about the exact same number of items and yet when you look at the dollar value it jumps all, all over the place simply because of the way that we're valuing things. Now there's also the average cost, cost method and you know it identifies the value of inventory and the cost of goods sold by calculating an average unit cost for all goods available for sales during a given period of time. And that valuation method assumes that the ending inventory consists of all goods available for sale. There's also something called the specific cost method and sometimes it's called the actual cost method. And this is where an organization actually has a software that's sophisticated enough to track the cost of an item from the time that it arrives until the time it's used up or sold. Now, th there's one more method that you find in manufacturing, basically for internal accounting purposes, and it's the standard cost method. And this is where an organization simply says, look, based on our, uh, you know, our purchasing history and, and our knowledge of these things, on this item, these widgets, these gadgets, gadgets, doodads, whatnots, whatchamacallits, we're going to set a, a standard cost price for that internally, no matter what it really did, in fact, cost us. And again, that's sort of an internal method. The, the point, and I'll say it once again, is that simply by changing your methodology, you're changing, at least on the surface, how much stuff you have because you're either going up and down on its value. Now, another way that organizations fool themselves into thinking that money measures what's actually moving into and through the facility is to focus on inventory turns. The inventory uh, tur uh, turnover ratio measures, on average, how many times inventory is replaced over a period of time. In its simplest sense, an inventory turn occurs every time an item is received, 
is used or sold and then is replaced. If an item came in twice during the year, uh, was then you know used or sold and then replenished, that would be two turns per year. If it happens once per month, it would be 12 turns per year and so forth. Now, inventory turnover is an important measure since the ability to move inventory quickly directly impacts the company's liquidity. And inventory turnover is calculated by using a, a, a pretty standard formula. It's the inventory turnover, or, or rather the inventory turnover ratio equals the cost of goods sold divided by the average inventory uh, that's in the house. And so, uh, essentially, when an I I item is sold, it's subtracted from the inventory and transferred to the cost of goods sold. Therefore, again, it, theoretically, it, it indicates how quickly inventory is moving for accounting purposes. But it doesn't necessarily reflect how many times actual physical items were handled within the facility. And that's true because the cost of goods sold uh, number can include items you sold but never actually handled. For example, what if your organization drops ships things? In other words, you act as a middle person. You know, you buy it here, you drop it off there. So that would go into the top line, that would go into the numerator, the dollar value of all items uh, you know, uh, sold or used during the year, but you never touched it. And so dividing it by the average inventory value of what you had in the house on an ongoing basis is a fairly meaningless number. In addition to that, another problem is the 80-20 rule. That, it, you know, some of your items, you know, let's say your A items, they're going to turn over many, many times during the year. Your B, your B items, not so much. And then, of course, your C items, even less than that. You know, tell you the truth, if we modified the formula a little bit and we divided the dollar value of all items uh, sold or used during the year, but from stock only, in other words, things that were actually, you know, handled in the house, divide that by the average inventory value for the year, that's at least going to give you a little bit better shot at understanding what really was even here. Okay? Now, everyone, you know, the, the inventory turnover ratio, again, is important for accounting purposes, but, you know, it, it just doesn't necessarily reflect reality. Okay? And, you know, it's important to understand that a lot of factors can cause a low inventory turnover ratio. You know, the company can be holding the wrong type of inventory, uh, its quality can be lacking, or there might be some sales or marketing issues. Bottom line, once again, money has failed to measure what's actually physically happening. Uh, you know, everyone, I'll say it again, measure accuracy in things, not dollars. It's either here or it's not. Now. You also have to be careful to uh, you know measure at the right time, and uh, I don't want to keep beating this particular horse. Uh, remember my discussion earlier about how you've got a difference in float time uh, between uh, you know the physical movement of items and the capture of information on on those items, and they can leapfrog one getting ahead of the other. And so, uh, just to summarize it, in batch software, items have left the building and yet they're still in the database it looks like they're here until the system is updated and if you're not updating frequently you basically have a lot of phantom items sitting around and that can cause a ripple effect someone sells an item they think we have it's not there an order selector goes out to find it can't find it turns in an adjustment slip takes the item out of stock then when the original paperwork goes through it takes it out of stock again and round and round we go and we keep adjusting our adjustments now in real-time software, it's where there's a pretty good chance that the the paper life, you know, the database life, the shell, the uh, record count is going to get ahead of the uh, actual physical movement. The point of all this, everyone, is that it's important to be, uh, basically measure in what's called the gap. And so, when you're doing your, your your counting and trying to figure out where you're at, it's much better to try to do it after the end of the business day when all of your receiving is in both in real time and, 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 and on paper you know both things have happened and uh, all your shipping is gone in real life and on paper uh, so that can either be at the end of the business day or prior to the beginning of the next one now it could be that uh, some of you uh, uh, actually have you know two shifts or, or even a 24 hour a day type of an operation 
So what, what's recommended generally is that you either count during the quietest shift or, or you create an artificial cutoff by using time of day. And let me explain what that means. Let's say that I want to, let's say, cycle count uh, 10 items. So I would let all of the uh, relevant stakeholders know about it. I would say, all right, receiving, stock replenishment, order selection, you know, order filling, and shipping on these 10 items today, what I want you to do is not only do whatever you normally do, but I want you to capture the time of day that it's happening. So everyone in this example, let us say that I go out to cycle count widgets at uh, 1 o'clock in the afternoon. And according to my stock records, I'm missing 10 of them. But I've collected in all these various little pieces of paper or information from the various departments. And I see that we received 10 items, of 10 of the, that item, at 11 o'clock this morning. Well, everyone, I suspect uh, that my, my missing 10 items are on the uh, receiving dock. They just simply haven't been put away yet, and then I could check that out. So again, by using time of day, you actually can create an artificial cutoff. And, and so whatever, whatever method you use, measure in the gap. Okay? Now, let's discuss how accurate accuracy has to be. And you know, you might think at first that accurate literally means 100% of your stock records match your shelf counts. Consider, however, your feelings about counting a large container of nails. In other words, everyone, I want to talk about tolerances. In counting a large container of nails, would you actually count each nail individually? Uh, you know, I don't think so. It's more probable that you're going to weigh about one pound of nails, count the number of nails in a pound, weigh all the nails, and then compute the total number of nails by comparing the number of nails in a pound to the number of pounds of nails in the entire container. Will your computation capture the exact number of nails in the container? Probably not. Do you care? Probably not. Why? Because of the nature of the item in question. In this case, in my example, nails, they're low cost, they're easy to acquire, they're hard to count individually, uh, and so forth. They're fungible, they're all exactly alike, and therefore, you probably would be willing to accept some percentage of tolerance in your numbers. Now, if you were within, say, up or down 5% of a perfect match between the record count and the shelf count, would you be satisfied? A, a, lot, of, a lot of us would be. Now, I want to tell you something, and I, a lot of you know this already. When it comes to measuring dollars in terms of inventory, most accountants will accept, if you did an annual physical inventory, they will accept an up or down tolerance of 3%. And a lot of organizations use that same 3% tolerance as far as physical items. Now, I'm going to come back to that. I want to talk more about that in a moment when we talk about how you actually you know, set tolerances. But do understand that that's out there. One thing, no matter what the item is, I'm aware of any industry at all that will allow more than a 5% tolerance up or down on any item even if it's you know the cheapest most common item uh, you know available now I'm hoping I'm guessing I suspect so far you all agree with me uh, on my example with the nails that you could accept some some tolerance alright but everyone what if it was diamonds would you accept a tolerance well, of course not actually you are accepting a tolerance but in this case it's zero you're setting your tolerance at zero and so, everyone, the bottom line is that many, actually I think in my experience anyway, most organizations allow a variance or a tolerance in considering their inventory record accuracy. That is, they allow a plus minus percentage of accuracy uh, you know, that, that they find acceptable. And you can set the tolerances by using dollars, actual units, or some combination of the two. Now, again, most accountants obviously are going to use dollars, but as I've already indicated a couple of times, I personally think you should use actual units. Again, it's either here or it's not. All right? Now, even though what I said a moment ago is true, that many accountants use uh, the plus or minus tolerance for 3%, uh, percent, and, and a lot of companies follow suit when it comes to actual physical items, um, I, I, I want to urge you, don't blindly use a fixed tolerance for everything. 
I think that you should carefully consider setting tolerances by item category and then only after considering various factors like the item's dollar value, its usage rate, the lead time it takes to get it in, uh, the level on your uh, bill of materials if you're in manufacturing. Obviously a, a subassembly has labor in it, more parts in it, etc. And, and it's a more important item than something that, that's just maybe a raw, raw item, raw material item. And so the higher on the level, level of the bill of materials, the uh, more tight, uh, you know, the, or rather the tighter uh, tolerance you're going to have. Also, is it a critical item? You know, one of the other things I've managed to do in my life was I was the chief executive officer for a time of a safety equipment company. And we sold those uh, Tyvek, you know, suits, so kind of moon suits. And there were some companies in Kansas City that did um, hazardous waste cleanup. And they didn't buy that much of the product from us, but when they needed it, boy, they needed it right now. And so we had a tight tolerance on that, not because, again, it was the most profitable item, and it was certainly not something we sold a lot of. However, it was critical. And, 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 and obviously, everyone, you could, could you know, have a whole combination of these things in setting this up. Now, once you've set all right, uh, tolerances, you should not make adjustments to your records when a discrepancy between the shelf and the record counts falls within the variance allowed. If an item does fall outside of the tolerance range, you would hunt down the reason. You would investigate it, and then you'd make a decision, am I going to adjust the record or not? Now, everyone, that sounds counterintuitive. You say to yourself, now, wait a minute, either it's here or it's not. Well, what do we, why are we setting our tolerance? It's like everyone, if you go back to my example of the nails, and we, 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 uh, you know, we weigh a pound of nails, we count them, we weigh all the nails, and let's say the, the, on our first computation, it comes out that we've got uh, you know, 17,004 nails. Then the next day, no one has touched the nails. We weigh them out again. Now there are 17,012. Uh, or the day after that, again, no one's touched it. Now there's you know, 12,010. Are you really going to adjust your adjustments even though they fell within your tolerance? Of course you're not. And so everyone, honestly, you know, in the example that, that, that you're, you're looking at, uh, notice that items 1, 4, and 8 are misses. They're outside of the tolerance range. We will investigate and make a decision, are we going to adjust our records or not? The others, though, they're all within their tolerance. However, only item number seven was exactly right. So what I'm saying is you're not going to investigate the hits where, where, you, it was, where it was within the tolerance, and so leave it alone. Mathematically, and I'm not enough of a mathematician to explain why this phenomena occurs, but mathematically, generally, the uh, pluses and the minuses actually cancel one another out. In addition, you might actually be covering up a problem if you constantly are making uh, uh, adjustments when you shouldn't. It's like, take a look at uh, item uh, number uh, two. You know, we, the, the record showed 100, we counted 95, uh, it was a hit. What if we don't do uh, an investigation and we just arbitrarily change it to 95? On the next cycle count, let's say that it is uh, at 91. Now again, it's a hit, and so we, we, we uh, don't investigate, but we change it again. It won't be until there's a crisis that we realize, oh, we were trending in the wrong direction. Had we left it alone, the second time we cycle counted it, it then would in fact have fallen you know, outside of its uh, normal range, and we would have picked up the fact that there was a problem. So once again, set your tolerances very, very carefully, and then leave it alone. All right? Leave it alone. To summarize, what we've been talking about in this module, although accounting has to use dollars to measure accuracy, you know, if we do that in trying to control our inventory, we'll be using a misleading unit of measure. Now, one particularly important item to measure and act on is dead stock. So let's go into our next module and talk about slow moving and dead stock. You know, over the past 25 years of presenting inventory seminars, I always ask audiences to show me, uh, by, by a raising of hands, those that have a lot of dead stock on hand. And I'm amazed that almost everyone raises their hand. Now, 
Dead stock and or slow moving stock is made up of items we have no use for at all or have no use for during a reasonably foreseeable amount of time in the future. And you know, a quick way of determining how much dead stock you have is to put together an inventory analysis report. And, and there's nothing you know magical or mystical about it. It's pretty straightforward. It's simply a matrix, a spreadsheet, and the column headings are on the far left, item uh, number and description, in other words, the stock keeping unit number, the SKU number, and a description, the quantity you have on hand, the unit cost, the actual annual usage, the projected annual usage, and that, that will then tell you how many months supply you have on hand. And because we're also looking at the dollar value of what we have on hand, we're suddenly going to realize how much of that is in fact dead and what the dollar value of all that happens to be. Okay? And so it, it really is it's an effective, really quick way of, uh, of opening your eyes up and opening upper management's eyes up to how much stuff is just in fact sitting around. Now, for those of you in manufacturing, not only can you use the method I just discussed to determine, you know, dead stock, but you can also compare what you have on hand against future planned production. In other words, you look at the bill of materials, sort of the recipe of what goes into your assemblies, and then, you know, if there's items that are not on any of the assemblies, you know, you, you, you've changed the bill, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, what goes into it, the component parts, etc., etc., you might realize that even though you have you know a million of something on hand, you're not going to use it for anything. Okay, and I'll tell you the problem with what I've said. You know, it, because I, I suspect that to, I'm really preaching to the choir for some of you. But you know, even identifying you know dead stock doesn't always immediately help you convince management that it has to go. Now, why is that? Well, often when you and I say to upper management, "Hey, let's get this stuff out of here." We're hit with the big three, all right? Why can't we get rid of it? Well, I've already paid for it is reason number one. It's worth a lot of money. Or we might need it someday. And my favorite is we might sell it someday. And you know on that last one, that always seems to be followed by an, a tag on sentence and we'll make a lot of money. Yeah, right. On all that stuff that's sitting out there with so much dust on it that people have played tic-tac-toe in the dust and there's all kinds of spider webs and mouse droppings on it. Yeah, we're going to sell it someday and make a lot of money. And everyone, you know, those explanations seem logical. And the idea of simply throwing something away, and by the way, I really don't mean that exactly as I say it. With some items, yes, just throw them away. But, you know, there's all kinds of other ways of disposing of items. Giving it to charity, selling it at a deep discount, finding a liquidator to take it off your hands, uh, uh, having a special promotion for your sales staff, um, even contacting competitors that might use uh, the item even though you don't use it anymore and see if you could sell it to them at some sort of a, a discount to at least get something back from it. Okay, So it does seem that when I say, hey, just throw it away, it's counterintuitive. But Everyone, I want to admit there are some practical problems with simply hauling the thing off to the dumpster. You know, decision makers often have difficulty with disposing of dead inventory because it's going to have an adverse impact on the balance sheet and it can deplete resources considered to be valuable for lending purposes. And, you know, here's what I mean anything that appears as an asset on the balance sheet has an accounting value. And that value, consisting of either an item's original cost minus depreciation, uh, you know, uh, uh, or uh, you know the fair market value of an item, it's called its book value. And you know, I'll tell you the truth: it, it could be irrelevant that the item might actually be worthless to either a customer or part of a manufacturing process. The reality, from an accounting standpoint, is if it even has a one dollar value on the books, then disposing of it, you take a hit for that dollar or if you sell at a discount, whatever the difference is between what it was valued at and um, you know what you got rid of it for. Now, in addition to that, some organizations, uh, uh, their capital structure is such that uh, they, they can't actually um, fund their operations through their own cash flow. And so they'll borrow money either against uh, current accounts receivable or they will borrow sometimes up to 50% of the dollar value of inventory as it's shown on the books. And again, I said this just a moment ago, from a purely accounting standpoint, you value inventory at the lower of cost or fair market value. 
And, you know, even again, even if something has a fair market value of nothing, uh, uh, and no matter what it costs you, uh, and, and therefore, you know, it, it theoretically has no value, as long as it's got this value on the books, often, again, bankers will loan some money against it. And so, you know, honestly, there are some, some reasons that are kind of hard to overcome. But let me give you some compelling arguments in favor of getting rid of the dead stock and convincing people why it's got to go. To begin with, one of the other questions I, I ask uh, you know, audiences when I'm doing a presentation is how many of you have too much space? Well, let me ask you, do you have too much space? Now, I'm guessing, based on my own life experience, that just about all of you listening to me broke out into a big smile because we're all hurting for space. And so, in terms of space utilization, you know, we can recapture a ton of space, valuable space, by getting rid of the dead stuff. You know, if you want to make, you know, that, that argument, uh, do it this way. In terms of space utilization, there are some simple mathematical facts to keep in mind. Multiplying an item's length times its width tells you the amount of square feet the item is occupying. Multiplying an item's length times its width times its height tells you the amount of cubic space it's occupying. So, if you were to actually figure out the cubic space taken up by your dead product, you would gain a powerful argument in favor of disposing of that, uh, that inventory. You know, to bolster the argument, you may want to ask your organization's chief financial officer how much the company is paying per square foot for rent. Then you obviously you know, can, can uh, multiply the square footage being consumed by the dead product times the rent per square foot cost. And I want to tell you, often that number you know, that comes out of that is just like staggering. And I think it, it's imperative that if you want to win these arguments that you be very specific. You know, providing actual numbers to a decision maker is far more effective than speaking in generalities like, dead stock is taking up a lot of space. You know, pointing out that obsolete stock is taking up, you know, 4,000 square feet or represents $2,000 per month in square footage costs. Now, that is a more compelling argument than, hey, it's taking up a lot of space. Now, not only does obsolete inventory take up a lot of space, it can also get in the way of workers. In other words, think of the labor costs of repetitively moving things around, out of the way, getting behind something, etc. Okay? And, and so, everyone, again, you need to be specific. Using terms like, you know, it, it takes us a lot of time to move stuff around, isn't going to cut it. But if you do a time in motion study on a per day, per week, per month, uh, an annualized basis, of how much labor it's taking to actually move the stuff around and then multiplying that times what you're paying people on an hourly basis that is going to make a much more compelling argument. Now I think maybe the strongest argument for getting rid of the dead stock is to talk about carrying cost, the K factor. The K factor represents uh, the number of pennies per inventory dollar per year a company is spending you know on um, you know, to house the inventory. In other words, if I have a one dollar item and it sits on my shelf for a year, and my K factor is twenty five percent, meaning I'm spending twenty five cents per dollar per year. At the end of that year, I now don't have just a dollar in it. I actually have a dollar twenty five. If it sits here for two years, now it's a dollar fifty, and so on. And there's a couple of different ways of computing the K factor. Now, right out of the accounting textbooks there are these factors that you consider. The cost of warehouse space, taxes, insurance, obsolescence and shrinkage, material handling costs, and the cost of money invested. Now, those of you that actually own your facility outright, you still have a warehouse space cost because of what's called an opportunity cost. If you have, for example, a $2 million building, and you've got $2 million tied up in bricks, mortar, and dirt, and that is preventing you from using that money for other purposes. And so uh, if you could put the money in the bank and earn 10% uh, interest, ha ha ha, but if you can earn 10% you know, interest, then obviously you're, you're, you're paying $200,000 a year in actual lost money because you have your money tied up. If you're, rent, you, if you're using it instead of renting it out, then whatever the fair rental value is per month, that's basically what you're denying yourself so you're actually paying it in terms of rent. 
Now, the cost of money invested is really a reflection of uh, interest rates. If, in fact, I've got a $2 million inventory and I borrowed the money to, to buy that inventory, then my cost of money invested is whatever I'm spending in interest per year. If I'm self-funding it, we're back to the opportunity cost where instead of putting my money into the, into the boxes, if I put it in the bank and I could earn whatever, then whatever I'm losing, that is my cost of money invested. So that last number will rise and fall based on whatever the uh, interest rates are from time to time. So we add those factors together, it gives us our total annual costs. You divide that by your average inventory value for the year, on, in other words, day in, day out, kind of what's in the house from a, a dollar value standpoint, and that gives you your K factor, all right? Now, there is kind of a, a down and dirty way of doing it, and it's sort of a rule of thumb. And what you simply do is you take, uh, uh, you know, 20% and add it to the current federal uh, uh, interest rate. The 20% uh, represents warehouse space, taxes, insurance, obsolescence, and shrinkage, and material handling, and the, uh, uh, the you know, interest rate, obviously, is your cost of money invested. Uh, I must tell you uh, that, you know, when I was writing my uh, inventory book, I tried to do a lot of research on where that rule of thumb came from. Everyone, I don't know. I, I can tell you, honestly and openly and sincerely, it's, it's a very commonly used thing by accountants throughout the entire country, and uh, I've done some training in other parts of the world, and I know it's used by accountants in England as well. So, again, you could either figure it out specifically by using the six factors, dividing it by your average inventory value, or using the rule of thumb, which one more time is you take 20% and add it to the current prime lending rate. Now, um, if you take that argument to an extreme, you, you know, you, you should only buy items when you need them because, you know, there's this carrying cost you're going to run into kind of an odd purchasing problem. You know, if I bought one million widgets all on one purchase order, uh, and let's say my purchasing costs, when, when you put together various factors, uh, is $5 per line item per PO, and you do figure this out on a per item per PO basis, um, let's say that's $5. So I bought a million of them, it cost me $5. But if I bought them 250000 at a time, you know, uh, and, and I did purchasing four times a year, then all of a sudden my purchasing cost went to $20. And let's get really silly. If I buy them one at a time, then obviously it's, it's $1 million times $5. My purchasing cost went to $5 million. Now, I told you a moment ago, there are six standard things that go into the carrying cost. There are no standard things that go into purchasing costs. It's whatever your, your own chief financial officer wants to put into it. But to figure out the per cost per PO, you figure out your purchasing costs on an annualized basis. You, uh, uh, you know, figure out the number of purchase orders per year. And you multiply that number of purchase orders per year by the average number of line items per PO. In the example that, that you're looking at, that ends up being uh, 20,000 uh, times that items were ordered. So if we divide our total annual costs by the number of times we, we ordered things, uh, in this example, 2,500 times, you can see it works out to $20 in purchasing costs. And so we've got to be careful. The optimum time, the, 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 the perfect time sort of to, to buy, uh, uh, something, uh, it's economic order quantity, is when the purchasing costs and the carrying costs are exactly the same. Now, all of that was a buildup for the really important thing. What's the important thing? Showing management why the dead stock's got to go based on the carrying cost. So let's consider an example. Let's say we've got $3 million uh, average inventory. Our K factor is 25%, in other words, 25 cents per dollar per, per, per year. Uh, let's say 5% of it is dead stock, and let's say we have an 18% gross profit margin. So $3 million times 5% dead stock means we've got $150,000 in dead stock. Multiply that times the 25% K factor, and you can see we are spending $37,500 a year to buy 
back our dead stock. We literally are repurchasing our dead stock every year for $37,500. Now, how much would your organization have to sell in goods and services to actually get that much money? Well, divide the $37,500 by your gross profit margin and look at that. You would have to sell $208,333 worth of goods and services to generate uh, $37,500 pre-tax and then what would you do with that? You'd buy back your dead stock with it. Everyone, I really urge you, this is a good strong argument. It really is. Now one thing, you know, we talk about negotiating. I use 5% to keep my, my uh, of dead stock to keep my example simple. If you use a generality like that, you will lose the argument. You are far better off to actually put together the kind of a report that I mentioned earlier where you're figuring out quantity on hand, et cetera, et cetera, and figuring out the actual items that you think are dead stock and the actual dollar amount they represent, and then use that in your calculation. Okay? In summary, ultimately the point at which your, your, your cost of carrying inventory matches the cost of purchasing it is the proper economic order quantity. Now, everyone what I just talked about, that concept of the economic order quantity is the basis of most of the algorithms that you find in inventory software. And let me explain some basic inventory forecasting concepts to you. To begin with, um, when inventory control you know, ideas began years ago, they began because everyone had stuff in uh, one bin. In other words, when the Industrial Revolution swept the United States in the 1790s, nobody really understood inventory control. And so if I had a raw material, widgets, they'd all be in a single bin. So I'd use them, use them, use them, and when they were you know, gone, I'd go, oh gosh, I've got to reorder, and I'd be out of business while I was waiting for a new order to come in. So it didn't take too long for people to go to a two-bin system. So bin one is working stock, bin two is working reserve, and the minute you dip into your working reserve, you reorder. Because what's in bin number two? A quantity equal to your usage rate during your lead time. So in a perfect world, when you uh, uh, you know reach into bin two and you reorder and you're using it up, right as you use the last item up, your new order will come in and you'll refill the bins. Now it's not a perfect world. And because of that, there's really a three bin concept. And the third bin is safety stock. Okay, now there are various formulas uh, that that uh, you, you can you know use. The most simple one to figure out your reorder point uh, is you, you take your usage rate times your lead time plus your safety stock, and that's your reorder point. Now, in this really simple formula, uh, as far as lead time, one week is 0.25 of a month, two weeks is 0.5, and so forth. So, a simple example of you know uh, you know of of you know how these things work is let's say I'm using 300 items a month. Now it takes me three weeks to bring it in. So 300 times 0 0.75 equals 225. So that's what I have to have uh, you know uh, you know on hand or available and so forth. But remember my safety stock. Generally, uh, just mathematically, between having nothing in, in bin number two and having it completely filled, what's the average? 50%. So if uh, it's 225 that I have to have on hand and on order, half of that in this example is roughly 113. So the minute I drop below 337 units, I need, need to reorder. Now, if I could reduce my lead time down to two weeks, notice that I would drop my reorder point down to 225. So the faster things come in and go out, the better off you're going to be. Now, let's go ahead uh, uh, and get into our last module, which is the perpetual inventories. The idea of a perpetual inventory is that your, your inventory records are accurate every single day. In other words, you've discovered the problems in your system, you've corrected them, you continuously uh, uh, you know, uh, improve the system so that all items are going through a system uh, that works. And so it doesn't matter if an item is expensive, inexpensive, fast mover, slow mover, long lead time, short lead time, it just simply doesn't matter 
because it's going through a system that works. Well, can you achieve that by doing an annual physical? Of course not, because everyone, there's a lot of problems with an annual physical inventory. To begin with, you have to count every stick, stone, and blade of grass in the building. And what do you find nationally, statistically? Account accuracy of only about 85%. You lose a lot of time. You have to shut down to do it. There are all kinds of time constraints you have to open back up. And that forces you often to use less skilled counters to do the counting, which then means that they're going to make mistakes as far as the product identification and the identification of units of measure. So you end up with inaccurate counts. But the worst thing is, because the audit trail is so long, you can't figure out what caused the disconnect between the paper count and the real, or rather the, the shelf count and the record count. You can't find it. Now, a better way of doing it and a way to actually get rid of the annual physical is to do cycle counting. Now, cycle counting is where you count a statistically significant cross-section of your items often enough to where what you counted uh, uh, represents all of the stuff. And so if we're counting it frequently and the rule of thumb is count 200 days a year, in other words four days a week, 50 weeks out of the year, 200 count days. So if you're counting a statistically significant cross-section of items this often, then again you've counted enough stuff to where it represents all of the stuff. And if you fix what's wrong with enough stuff, then you fix the system. And, you know, it sounds like a lot, the 200 counting days. You say, boy, it's going to take a lot of time. Actually, it's not, because think about it. If your system's a mess right now, when you first start doing cycle counting, it's going to take you, you know, some time to work your way uh, through counting an item and then reconciling it, etc. But as your records become better and better and better, you're able to actually count a much larger body of items a day because you don't then have to do a lot of reconciliation. In addition, why should you take someone, a cycle counter, who understands the system really well and doom them to doing, you know, uh, eighth grade math, walking around counting boxes? For many of you, a much, much better way of doing this would be at the beginning of a work shift or at the end of the day, have, let's say, five people count five items each. They don't have to know whether it's right or wrong. They just go out and they do the count and they turn the count information into the cycle counter. And um, by doing that, you then free up the cycle counter to spend his or her time fixing the system. And everyone, honestly, this is not some sort of revolutionary concept. An audit trail of once a year is too long. There have been so many intervening transactions, you can't figure out where you went wrong. If you count it twice a year, it's a shorter audit trail, but it's still an awfully long one. If we counted you know, four times a year, that's better still. But why is it better? Because we're getting closer and closer in time to where the disconnects occur. If we're counting every day, we're going to find the problems really pretty close to when they occurred. That's going to give us a chance to fix them. Now, the cycle counting goals are fact finding, problem finding, and solution finding. And I'm urging you to start off, don't, don't jump into any cycle counting program you know, wholeheartedly until you've gone through and used a control group. Now, a control group is, uh, you know, where you, you, take, you take 100 of your items that are, a st uh, that are a cross section of all your items, that are a fair representation of all your items, and you count 10 of them a day, and you keep that up for 100 days, 100 counting days. Now, why would you want to do that? Because right off the bat, it, you're going to get immediate identification of significant system problems. It's like one of the most common problems that a lot of you have are people going into your stock rooms and taking things and they have no business being in there and they don't write it down right or they don't write it down at all, etc. Do you really think that, that it would take you counting 10,000 items to figure out that that's a major problem? One of the things I ask my audiences when I'm doing a public seminar on this as I say, how many of you feel that if you could stop the unauthorized entry into your stock rooms, uh, you know, uh, and people not writing things down, et cetera, et cetera, that your inventory record accuracy would jump by at least five or six percentage points? And I, 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 all I can do is ask you to take this as, as uh, uh, on faith 
but everyone I'm honestly reporting to you that most of the time over 90% of the hands go up. In addition to that, unless you're some sort of a genius, you won't understand all the comings and goings within your own system at first. Now if I'm looking at the same 10 items every 10 counting days, then I'm beginning to, under, to really understand the who, what, when, where, why, and how of my system. And remember where I started? I said write down you know, on a piece of paper the physical movement and then next to it you know, what's going on as far as information capture. That's what you're going to learn. You're going to self-teach yourself what's really going on. And once again, unless you're some sort of a genius, when you first start doing the uh, cycle counting, you're going to make some mistakes. And so it's a lot easier to actually, you know, correct your errors uh, using a hundred rather than, you know, however many stock keeping units you presently have. So I want to summarize. Select a hundred items as a control group. Make sure it's a true cross section of all your items. Count ten of them a day uh, for a hundred counting days. And um, by the time you finish that, you really will have corrected many of the more obvious problems uh, that, that you're ever going to encounter. Now why wouldn't you just keep going with that control group uh, alone? Because for some of you, you've got thousands of items and 100 simply is not statistically significant. And so what you'd want to do is you would want to use uh, you know, uh, one of the other, or one of the cycle counting methods. There are the locational audit method, there's random selection, there's diminishing population, and there's the ABC method. In the locational audit method, which by the way is my favorite, what you do is uh, you're actually just starting on one side of your stock room and you know counting uh, uh, you know one area uh, that day, then the next area, the next area, the next area, and so you're basically counting wall to wall during whatever the cycle is. So if I have, let us say, eight areas that I'm storing product in every eight days, I will have counted wall to wall. Now does that mean that I've counted every stick, stone, and blade of grass that was in the house during the eight days? No, because items will move uh, uh, away in front of me before I get to them and come in behind me after I've passed that area by. Does that matter? No because every one of this is really, really important to understand. Cycle counting is about counting a statistically significant cross-section of items so that they represent all the items. You don't have to count everything as you would with a normal annual physical. Now the reason I like this locational audit method so much is that most of you, not all of you, some of you still have old legacy software systems, but most of your software uh, allows you to know not only how much of an item you have, but where it's at in your facility and how many in each location. And so if I have uh, widgets in four locations, I've got one location supposed to have 50, another location with 50, um, and, and, and so forth, I count you know, this one area today, and it says I'm supposed to have 50 widgets. If there's only 40 there, now I, I know I've got to go look in these other areas and let's say I find my 10 missing widgets. Well on one hand I'm very happy because now I've got all my widgets but I, I'm, I, I'm alerted that there's something wrong because I didn't have the right item in the right quantity in the right place at the right time and so I'm going to find out why that, got, that was messed up. Now if there were 50, there's supposed to be 50 and there are 50 then I can go on about my business. I don't have to worry about the other locations. And so what I'm suggesting to you is that the locational audit method, which by the way is also sometimes called the block method of cycle counting, it allows you to do a double audit. It allows you to audit the quantity at the same time that you're auditing the system from a qualitative standpoint. I really like this system. Random selection is where, again, you're just counting enough items per day to where you count everything. And so if I've got 10,000 items, um, uh, you know, and, and, I, I, and someone says, oh, count uh, all of them four times a year, it's impossible. It, it, it's impossible because 10,000 items times four counts is 40,000 counts. Divide that by 200 counting days, it's 200 items a day. Even if it's five minutes per count on average, that's 1,000 counting minutes a day. Divide that by 60 minutes in an hour, and you're talking almost 17 hours a day and counting, not even with any reconciliation. So of course that's silly. So if I did have this really large number of items, 10,000, 
If I counted 50 items a day for 200 days, that's 10,000 counts during the year. And so even though I'm doing it randomly, as long as I'm being intellectually honest and trying to count a cross-section of my items, it's, it's just as valid a system as any other. The diminishing population technique uh, as far as the system is what we basically talked about with the control group. You simply start out at the top of your line item master and you just count X number of items per day, whatever you know you, you feel is a, a, you know, a, a appropriate given your own circumstances and the number of SKUs you have. And so you start at the top of the line item master, you count all the way down, you start over again. Now that is treating all items equally and so you know, if you say, I must count all items a certain number of times per year, you might actually find yourself drowning in the math. Now, the thing is, though, the diminishing population technique is part and parcel of the last technique I'm going to talk about, and that's the ABC method. It's where you count your A items more often than your B, and your B items more often than your C. And the ABC method is based on the 80-20 rule, where we isolate the, uh, the A items by figuring out what are the small number of items that have either the highest dollar value or the greatest usage rate. Uh, so our A items are going to be a small population of items. Well, using the diminishing population technique, I can count those many times during the year. Uh, just as an example only, let's say 12 times a year. My B items will be a little bit bigger population. Maybe I count those four times a year, and the C items I only count once. And so that is how you're doing that. Now, I want to recommend to you that you actually merge together dollar value and usage rate to determine the value of an item to be an A item, B, or C. And you do that simply by taking the unit value and multiplying it times the annual usage rate for that item. Uh, and, and that's how you can kind of get a blended uh, you know, value. And the reason I'm suggesting it is you want to uh, take care of the greatest cross-section of people in your organization the people that are concerned about the money and the usage rate both. So that's the ABC method. Well everyone, in conclusion let me end as I began. It's important that you map out what's happening to each item of your inventory as it moves through your system in terms of both its real life and its paper life. By imposing that discipline on yourself you will self-discover where the disconnects in your system are so you'll be able to actually you know take care of them. Well everyone that's all the time we have for today. Thank you so much for participating. This concludes our special career track uh, seminar, or webinar rather, Effective Inventory Management. Now, for more information about the many training resources we offer, uh, to request a free copy of our latest catalog, or to receive a schedule of current seminars in your area, please call toll-free 1-800-556-3009 or visit our website at www.careertrack.com. Thanks again. My best wishes to you all.